again. And I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping notes. Even though this is an audio only webinar, we do want your participation to be as interactive as possible. So if you can start um, putting questions in the chat box, we're going to be having Chris Burkett to moderate the questions between Eric Pullen and John Moser uh, to answer any of your questions on Richard Nixon. And we will have a very lively discussion, much like the one we had prior to the start of the webinar. So Chris, would you like to take it away for us? Sure. Thank you very much, Shante. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this Tuesday evening uh, webinar made possible by the Ashbrook Center, uh, part, which is an independent center at Ashland University, offering a number of resources to help teachers teach young citizens what it means to be Americans. My name is Chris Burkett. Um, I'm associate professor of political science and history and co-chair of our Master of Arts in American History and Government program here at Ashland University. Uh, we've been running uh, a series of monthly Saturday, Saturday webinars uh, this year on the theme of presidents and their times, and I'm very happy to be able uh, to be part of this, what you might consider a special, a special edition uh, webinar on Richard Nixon. So the point of these webinars is to pull together some thoughtful scholars and have a conversation about American presidents. And we encourage you, uh, as Ashante just mentioned, we encourage all of you to join us in that conversation tonight by submitting questions via the chat box. Uh, I will try to get to as many of those as possible and uh, pass those on to our distinguished panelists tonight. I'll also mention that some of the documents that were recommended uh, tonight, um, I believe that they're available on our teachingamericanhistory.org website uh, in our extensive document database. If they aren't, I will add them. Uh, but for these webinars this year, we've been drawing a lot of inspiration from our documents, uh, again, which are available at teachingamericanhistory.org, or TAH.org for short. So let me uh, introduce our panelists for tonight. Dr. John Moser is professor of history at Ashland University, where he teaches courses on modern European, American, and West, or East Asian history. He's published uh, numerous works on subjects ranging from comic books to Japanese foreign policy, He's the author of four books, the most re recent of which is The Global Great Depression and the Coming of World War II. He is also my co-chair in the Master of Arts in American History and Government program at Ashland University. And he also teaches in that program uh, a wide range of courses. Um, he's taught including America Between the Wars, uh, America During the Cold War, and American Foreign Policy since, uh, since 1898. Dr. Eric Pullen. Is associate professor of history and Asian studies at Carthage College in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Professor Pullen's primary teaching and research interests address the international relations between India and the United States during the 20th century. He also teaches courses on the history of India, the history of the United States, Western heritage, global heritage, and the history of dictionaries. And we're also fortunate to have Eric teach in our master's program at Ashland University. Uh, he's taught a course, uh, for example, on the American way of war. Not sure what you taught most recently, Eric. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Ulysses S. Grant, yeah. Were you doing a text course on his memoirs? Is that right? That's exactly right. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for doing that. It's great to see both of you tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm just going to start with, uh, with a sort of broad question and then turn it over to you two who know, who know a lot about Nixon. Um, most of us are familiar with Nixon's reputation as something of a dishonest politician and, of course, his involvement in, in Watergate. But I'm hoping that tonight the two of you will teach us something about Nixon that we may not know. So let me just start with a broad question. What positive accomplishments uh, can we chalk up to Nixon's presidency? And either one of you can take it away and we'll just see where this goes. Anything positive to say about President Nixon? It's hard, John. It is very hard. I I think uh, I think detente was a sincere and noble effort. I don't know in the long run that it accomplished uh, many of its objectives, but uh, I, I think it was something that was uh, I think it was something that was worth pursuing. Worth um, it, you know, he. he uh, he brought about a stunning reversal 
in American foreign policy, certainly in uh, in terms of the country's relationship to the People's Republic of China, uh, and uh, and that opened the door to to to, to closer relations with the Soviet Union. Again, I, these were these were tactical accomplishments. It's not clear to me that the strategic goals of, of detente uh, were met, but I'm hoping that's something we can get to eventually. John, can you, can you just say something more about what detente meant for Nixon? Because that's a term that's often misunderstood because, for example, I think the way uh, Jimmy Carter talked about detente may have been different in some ways than the way Nixon thought about it. Can you elaborate yeah. a little bit about why Nixon went down the road toward detente, maybe? I mean, Carter. <clears throat> Carter, interestingly, ran as a uh, as an opponent of detente in 1976, but of course he, he ended up continuing the policy until '79 with the uh, with the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, the detente is simply a reduce a reduction of tensions, um, and the, it, so it, it or or an attempt to really deal with the Soviet Union on a practical, or Nixon would have said, a realistic basis. Um, to look at it, to, to forget the fact that it's communism versus capitalism or democracy versus dictatorship. The idea is the United States and the Soviet Union are two competing superpowers. Uh, sometimes the analogy is used of two scorpions in a bottle. They may hate each other, but they have to recognize that they're both stuck in this bottle, and if they try stinging each other, they're going to—they're likely to miss and sting themselves. So they're going to—they stand a lot more to gain from uh, from developing a modus vivendi, right, a way of living together, than it, that would pay off far more than trying to remain at one another's throats. So that's really the uh, that that's really the nature of the strategy. There were a number of goals that Nixon hoped would follow from that, among which was going to be negotiating a, an honorable end to the Vietnam War. Uh, that was a that that was pretty much a complete failure on Nixon's part. Um, I'm not sure that he could have gotten any better than he got. But really, one of the driving forces behind détente was a desire to extricate the country from Vietnam on honorable terms. So I've, I've heard the term, um, by the way, jump in any time, Eric. I, I don't mean to ask too many questions here at the beginning, but I've heard the term normalization of, of relations associated with, with Nixon and detente. Is that an accurate description of what he was trying to do? And was he the first to do this? Is that why he's often associated with this? In answer to your, your, your immediate question, I, d I don't think Nixon is, in fact, the, the first to do this. Uh, I think the first president that we had that, that tried to establish uh, detente, although he didn't use the word as frequently uh, as Nixon did, uh, but the first president to do that was, was, was Eisenhower. Uh, Kennedy tried to do it a little bit. Uh, I think even Johnson tried to, to engage in, in a certain amount of of, of detente, but no, I, I, I think most of the, even though Nixon wasn't the first, he's the one that the policy is most most frequently associated with, and, he, and I think he deserves it. But uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to your original mm -hmm. question, and that is what, you know, what is there positive about, about Nixon's legacy, uh, or at least uh, what is there positive about Nixon's policy of detente? And although I loathe Nixon, and I think Nixon was a horrible president, I think he's one of the uh, one of the two worst presidents of the 20th century, tied only with Jimmy Carter. And it's, a, it's actually a three-way tie, in my opinion. It's Jimmy Carter, uh, uh, Nixon, and Woodrow Wilson. Uh, but that's a discussion for another time. Uh, the, uh, the, the positive is something I'd like to bring out. I, I agree with almost everything uh, Dr. Moser said, but I would emphasize... The, um, the, uh, the engagement that Nixon had with, with China. There were lots of negatives that, that resulted from the engagement with China, but in the long run, or immediate negatives in the 1970s that occurred because of Nixon's or, or the United States engagement with, with China. But in the long run, I, I, I think it was a, was, a, was a net positive. In addition, what are some of the leg positive legacies? Often, there are legacies that are the result of, of accidents. 
But I think uh, Nixon's uh, willingness to uh, to help Israel in the uh, in the 1973 war, I think that was a positive. But it occurred really despite Nixon's uh, better judgments and, and opinions about foreign policy. I think that the only reason Nixon helped Israel in 1973 was largely because he was trying to tweak the Soviets, not because he had any, any great love of Israel or because he was trying to achieve stability in the Middle East. I think he helped Israel because he was trying to tweak the Soviets. Uh, but, but again, that's a discussion we could have uh, at a different time. To go back to another point you made about, or, or I don't know if it's you or Moser who made the point, but I, th I think we need to just... Someone used the phrase normalization of, of, uh, of foreign relations. Yeah, that, that was me. I just threw that out there. I'm not sure if that's an appropriate term or not. No, I think, I think it is an appropriate term because I think that's exactly what Nixon was trying to do, was normalize the, uh, the relationship that the liberal, democratic, capitalist United States and its allies in the West and in Asia had with the Soviet Union, or with the communist, uh, socialist, uh, Soviets. I think what he was there, 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 there are three elements of of detente that that Nixon was really trying to uh, uh, to underscore, and that is arms control, uh, nor, uh, 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 reduction of conflict in Europe and in um, uh, and and in the developing world, and then trade. And he tried to look at the Soviet Union as if it were not an ideological revolutionary power, but rather as just, like John said, just as another scorpion in the bottle, no different than anyone else. It's worth pointing out, when we use the term normalization, um, recently there's been talk about normalizing relations with Cuba. And, and it's really in a different sense. Uh, the United States had recognized the Soviet government as early as 1933. There had been trade with the Soviet Union from the very earliest days. So in that sense, relations had always been normal between the United, the United States and the Soviet Union. Unlike China, which had not been recognized, or Cuba for that matter, which was only recognized, if it was, was only recognized formally by the United States, or the Castro regime, I should say, was only recognized formally a few months ago. But in terms of treating it as, as a non-ideological power, right, as just another superpower, not the, uh, the, the, the flagship of godless atheistic international communism, in that sense, it was a more normal relationship. Yeah, yeah that's very interesting, yeah, because I've been, I'm sorry, Eric, go right ahead. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to plug in something for my... Uh, for my microphone here, but uh, the uh, the one of the things that I, I think is hard for people to understand, or at least my students, uh, my younger students, who have uh, you know no memory of Bill Clinton, never never mind Reagan or Nixon or Lyndon Johnson, they have no memory of these of these people. It's hard for them to realize that uh, there was a, a tremendous ideological component to the Cold War. Uh, many Americans feared communism, not just in the Soviet Union, but also Cuba, China, because of its revolutionary ideology. And, and Nixon's foreign policy in the United States really went against not just Republicans, uh, but also Democrats in terms of how it tried to ignore the ideological component that, that motivated Soviet foreign policy. Hmm. Well, that's fascinating, especially I've been... I'm teaching an undergrad course on foreign policy this semester, and we've been reading just recently speeches from Truman, Eisenhower, and, and Kennedy. And now that you point this out, it's amazing how how much their the rhetoric of their speeches is directed against the ideology. I mean, they they frame almost all of their speeches uh, in the term in terms of this is a this is an ideological conflict, right? And one of my students pointed out that um, at least in the case of Kennedy, it seems like he's working against his own purposes at times because he claims to be trying to establish some kind of relations with the Soviet Union, uh, better relations to try to work together to find out what they have in common. I know he met with he met with Khrushchev, right, I believe. Um, and yet at the same time he, he gives these speeches framing the Soviet Union as uh, the U Soviet Union in, in these uh, sort of almost, I don't think he used the word evil, but, but, um, but bad ideological terms. 
Uh, so was Nixon trying to avoid that kind of pitfall, or was that not something deliberate on his, his on his part? I think when you think of when you you have to remember that Kennedy's relationship with Khrushchev was extremely stormy. Uh, from the very first time they met early in his presidency, they clashed. Uh, Khrushchev was trying to test the measure of the man, and he frankly found Kennedy wanting, and and in fact bullied him. Um, and, yeah. and and this shaped Khrushchev's attitude toward the United States for years to come, uh, up at least up through the uh, through the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, I would say what's really striking about Nixon's policy, which gave rise to the saying, oh, it takes a Nixon to go to China, or only Nixon to go to China, is that if you had said in the late 1940s or early 1950s that Richard Nixon would be the president who was going to end up making an opening to, to red China or uh, seeking to reduce tensions with the Soviet Union, people would have said, you're crazy. Because he, he, he made a name for himself as a diehard anti-communist. Uh, he was the one who believed Whitaker Chambers in the Alger Hiss case. When almost no one else would, he sided with Whitaker Chambers. I, I don't know if this is the place to go into detail on the Hiss case. But uh, Whit Whitaker Chambers had been, had been a, um, a confessed former Soviet agent who claimed that Alger Hiss... Had, had sent him confidential material, had sent classified materials. And uh, almost no one was willing to believe Whitaker Chambers, who didn't seem credible. He, after all, was a self-confessed former communist agent. He was kind of a dumpy-looking guy. And Alger Hiss, who was a product of the best schools, he was director of the Carnegie Foundation. He was a, 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 he was a good-looking guy, like a movie star. Everyone loved him. He was the best and the brightest of the elite uh, Eastern establishment. And Nixon, who very much distrusted and disliked the elite Eastern establishment, being a Californian, uh, believed Chambers, and Chambers, it turned out, was absolutely right. But in any case, liberals loathed Nixon, not because of much of his politics. I mean, if you look at his political record in, in terms of domestic stuff, he was he was very much a moderate Republican. But on the issue of communism, he was I, I mean he was reliably anti-communist, uh, and, and 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 so for him to be the president who would do this was really quite shocking. So it was viewed as a kind of about face on his part that he was getting soft. He was going soft a little bit. No, uh, go ahead, no? Before, before, I might not. I, I I don't see that as softness. Uh, but I want okay. to go back to a point you made earlier, and that is, if you look at the documents that that we provided, and you look at uh, uh, Nixon's uh, memo to Melvin Laird, you look at the uh, document uh, regarding the Soviet Union. Uh, Nixon's visit to China, you really do not see the word communism in there until you yeah. get to yeah. the memo from John Ashbrook. And before we talk about whether this is an about face or not uh, on Nixon's part, uh, you were making the point about, or someone was making the point about Nixon's attitude about, about communism. And I think it's really important to understand that if you were to ask most Americans between the years 1948 and 1968, it's a 20-year period uh, that represents Nixon's tenure as a senator, Nixon's tenure as a vice president in the Eisenhower administration, his failed attempts uh, to run for the governorship in, in, uh, in California, and then his, 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 his career running as a, as a politician, you were to ask Americans, who is America's biggest anti-communist? It's Nixon. Or hmm. you might say McCarthy, you might say J. Edgar Hoover, but Nixon's certainly in the top three. And yet, when Nixon becomes president, he adopts a completely different approach to foreign relations. And this is why I, wanna, why, why I say that it's not necessarily a, a, a turnaround. It's because I think Nixon takes on a view of foreign relations that we call realist, right? And by realist, Nixon has the attitude that nation states have interests. There's not a difference between France or Cambodia or, or uh, Brazil and Nigeria or the United Kingdom and Italy. 
in terms of how they view their self-interests. Ideology is, an, is, is really, in Nixon's view, a domestic issue. And so the reason why I argue that it's not necessarily a turnaround for Nixon is because he cares about communism not so much as an international issue, but he cares, of, he cares about it because it's an American domestic issue. In the 1940s and 50s, he's obsessed, rightly, but he's obsessed with communism as, as a form of espionage, as a form of sabotage or subversion in the United States. Once he starts looking at communism as a, as, as a global phenomenon or as an international issue, I think Nixon really is starting to say to himself, listen, the communists are no different than we are. They want to have a sphere of influence. They want to have a, a, a realm in which they're in control. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't think Nixon really has had that much of a turnaround. I think he's basically, he's got a very coherent, I disagree with it, but he's got a coherent theory of international relations that he applies like a template over, uh, over um basically over the planet. It, you might he, disagree. He, he, I, I don't disagree with that. And adding to it is remembering this, you need to remember the circumstances of the late 1960s. Um, um, Nixon believed that in many ways the United States and the Soviet Union were occupying similar ground. That uh, both were dealing with uh, with, with, with popular protests, right, that was going on college campuses in the United States, but then there was Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia. Um, there was also an understanding on Nixon's part that the leadership of the Soviet Union was not the old revolutionary kind of, of Stalin or even Khrushchev, but the, the men, Brezhnev and the men who surrounded them, surrounded him, were rather a bunch of elderly men who were in fact quite conservative. I mean, not conservative in the American sense, but conservative in the sense that they weren't crazy about change. And, uh, and, and Nixon, in a way, saw himself as that same kind of conservative. Not ideologically conservative, but conservative in the sense of resisting change. So here we have these two superpowers who, despite their, their, their antipathy that had gone back to the, uh, to the, to the late 40s, in fact, wanted the same kinds of things. They're being challenged by upstarts. The Russians are being challenged even within the communist bloc. So these are two superpowers, both with a, with a mutual interest in, in maintaining, maintaining order. Oh, that's interesting. Don't mind. I, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm sorry. But the, the oh, idea of using your phrase of normalization, which I think is very apt, and then the idea of relaxation. Actually, that, uh, I don't know if we said that before, but the term detente in French means relaxation. The, uh, the entire theory of detente is predicated on a conservative vision of foreign policy. You have, as John said, you have the, the Prague Spring. Remember, in 1968, the Czechoslovakians basically uh, uh, staged a revolution against Soviet rule. And it failed, but that signaled to the Soviets that they need to focus more on keeping their house in order than fomenting revolution abroad. 1968 was the worst year in the United States in terms of college protests. It was not only, I mean, the, the year began with the Tet Offensive. It end, or, uh, in the middle of the year, you have the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy, and throughout the entire year, you have college protests that are extremely violent and in the eyes of Nixon and the Democratic Party, which maintains control until January of, uh, of 1969 in the Lyndon Johnson administration, extraordinarily destabilizing protests, not only in the United States, but you've got protests in Mexico, in France, even in China and in the Soviet Union itself. Detente is a reaction one way of looking at the detente is that it is a reaction to the uh, uh, to the radical demand for change. Many people around the planet have been living under under fear of, of nuclear annihilation, and into the 1960s, you have these these wars in the third world. Third world, you have you have protests in 
both the communist bloc and in the uh, in what was then called the free world, and both the Soviet and the uh, uh, American leaders are desperately conservative in the sense that they feel that they have to manage this revolutionary ferment. And there's a collusion between the Soviets and the uh, and the Americans in terms of minimizing the amount of st- or, uh, 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 destabilizing protest and and uh, and dissent within their own countries. And and if I may, there's, I think there are three things that uh, 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 I think I said this earlier, but there are three things that that we really need to think about. What they tell about. one is arms control. Let people think that the United States and the Soviet Union are serious about minimizing the risk of nuclear war, um, minimizing the amount of conflict in the, in the developing world, in particular Vietnam, and then third, uh, normalizing trade relations. And it may seem odd because we think of the communists as, 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 as revolutionary socialists and, and, uh, and, and wanting a global, uh, global economic system that has nothing to do with capitalism, but basically... Normalizing trade relations with the Soviet Union is another way of telling the world that the Soviet Union is a normal nation just like anyone else. And so detente is a profoundly conservative foreign policy posture. That's really interesting. No, no, that's really interesting. So I have to ask the question. You're framing this as a a profoundly conservative approach to foreign policy. Uh, How would you contrast that? Is there such a thing as a liberal... Uh, was there such a thing as a liberal approach to foreign policy? And so how, how would that have been different from what you're calling this the conservative liberal, approach? The liberal approach, I think, uh, could be summed up well with um, JFK's. Right? Pay any price, bear any burden for uh, yeah, for freedom. Um, that that mm-hmm. that would have been the definition of liberalism. Of course, you know, you, you, at the same time, you had, by the late 1960s, a wing of the Democratic Party that was that was going in a very different direction. Um, I, I don't know quite what to call that, but uh, in a way it was, in a way it was kind of neo isolationist. I mean, in a, in a way it was it was even uh, it, it was even uh, supportive of uh, of of, for instance, um, the the government in Peking. I'm not in the Democratic Party, but but I'm talking about the extreme left in the United States. But I, but if you if you ask me what the liberal approach to foreign policy was, I would say it's Cold War liberalism of the Truman and JFK variety, and that's very and, and it was very ideological, in a way that Nixon's foreign policy was not. And note that I'm not using we're not using conservative in the sense of uh, of, of, of of ideological conservatism, but but really in a in a sense of, of, of maintaining stability, maintaining order, almost a Metternichian kind of conservatism. And that's and, uh, I was trying to avoid uh, Henry Kissinger, who was, who was yeah. Nixon's closest advisor on foreign affairs, was a huge fan of Clemens von Metternich, the Austrian diplomat who really was the architect of the Congress of Vienna in 1815. Yeah, I, had, I was going to ask about I'm sorry, John, I cut you off. But I actually... I agree with Moser as far as he goes, but I disagree uh, with his definition of, of, of liberal foreign policy. I, I, uh, I think he's right in terms of Truman, Kennedy, Johnson. I think they were willing to pay any price uh, to stop the spread of communism. But one of the differences between a liberal foreign policy, and I mean that with a lowercase l, not, uh, 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 I mean that in the, in the, uh, in the right. American sense, not in the international sense, but I go back to Woodrow Wilson, and, and even Republicans have practiced liberal foreign policy, but it's the idea that you need, and, and in some ways it's no different than the communists. It's the idea that you need to change the domestic uh, regime in order to create a, an, international liberal, uh, uh, an international liberal order. In other words, you have to have a... a Roughly capitalist system and a and a liberally de- democratically elected government, in order uh, for the international system to function correctly. In that sense, Republicans and Democrats until Nixon were basically on the same page. Nixon, or, I'm sorry, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson were willing to pay any price because they believed that a liberal democratic order 
was the best remedy for peace and security internationally. Nixon, I think, departs from that because he says, you know what? We don't have to nation build. We don't have to change the, the, the uh, domestic regime of, uh, of a particular country. And in that sense, I disagree with Moser because I think that the, uh, the liberal, lowercase l, liberal international order is one that's actually quite intrusive and one that does try to change the domestic order uh, in, in this or that country, whether it's in Latin America, Africa, Asia, Europe, it doesn't matter. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, it, the way both of you are actually framing Nixon's approach here, his strategy as, as, as being conservative, is, is really striking to me, first of all, because at least domestically, um, even among conservatives, Nixon is thought of as, as, as leaning, if not somewhat, uh, you know, quite a bit to the left in some ways. Being, uh, you know, he's often associated. He's often described as a as a liberal. As you know, John, and uh, I know you both know this, but uh, you mentioned uh, Congressman Ashbrook, who ran against uh, Nixon for the Republican primary, and his slogan, of course, was "No Left Turns." Um, trying to frame uh, Nixon, at least domestically, as being very liberal-minded in a certain way. But in foreign policy, I, I hadn't thought of him in these terms. It is a it is, a, in that sense, contrasted with that liberal approach to foreign policy, very conservative. I can see that very clearly. But since I mentioned Ashbrook again, and somebody brought this up earlier, um, one of you, I'm not sure which one, recommended uh, uh, Congressman Ashbrook's critique of detente, which is one of the documents uh, included in the uh, 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 packet that's available for download here, which came in 1973. Can you say something about if, if Nixon's approach was was so conservative, why did why was Ashbrook so opposed to it? Um, this is the this well, is the problem with slippery terms like conservative and liberal. Oh, right. We're talking right. over each other. But he's right. In other words, if, if 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 Nixon was so conservative, why did conservatives oppose him? Yes. Right. Because the right. reason why is why, why John. Because Nixon was a Metternichian style conservative. And not really an American style conservative. You've got to explain that to me. I, I actually don't understand that. Please. Well, uh, I mean, he, he's Nixon is conservative in the old European sense of of, of maintaining stability and order. I see. And it's not okay. to say that American conservatives have not traditionally been interested in stability and order, but um, it was conservatives who were, well, in a way. Ashbrook was calling for a return to the Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy approach to, to foreign policy. So in that way, I, I mean, he was he was being as conservative as those guys were, and they never would have called they never really called themselves conservatives. He's reinjecting ideology into the uh, into the into the Cold War again, and um, and 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 I think he's doing that in response to what's going. Going on on the on the far left, uh, on there's there's an increasing there was an increasing tendency in the late 60s for the far left to apologize for the Soviet Union and to defend the Soviet Union and, and you hadn't really seen that since the 1930s or the early 1940s in the United States and so um, so if it looks like Nixon is being liberal. I think it's because there is confusion in the minds of Ashbrook and others on the right that, 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 that to them it looks like Nixon is performing a soft, is engaging in a softer version of what Noam Chomsky and others on the far left are doing uh, in, in praising the Soviet Union. So, so Nixon all of a sudden shows up in China. China! Right, the country that had been the bete noir of the of, of, of U.S. foreign policy ever since uh, ever since Mao Zedong took over in the late 1940s, um, it, it's it's easy to see how that could have been mistaken for uh, for for a willingness to turn a blind eye to the evils of that regime. And, and let's be frank here: Mao Zedong was the greatest killer of the 20th century, probably the greatest killer of all times. And, uh, and, and that's disturbing. I mean, even if we understand that Nixon's idea is, look, I don't have to like what they're doing over there, uh, 
but the rule it shouldn't affect our ability to have have normal relations with that country. It, it you know it's still horrible. It's like if, if if you know that there's a murderer in your neighborhood, do you make do you still you know bake him cookies? It, 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 uh, that's, that's a terrible analogy, but I'm going to let Eric jump <laughs> it is in. It's a terrible analogy, and, and I'm going to interrupt you, Moser. Uh, here, here's, here's my take on this. It's like this. The reason why Nixon goes to China is to use China as a, as a counterweight to the Soviet Union. Right. The exactly. Difference, it's a means to an end. Yeah. The difference between China and the Soviet Union in terms of killing is this. In Nixon's mind, not my mind or your mind, but Nixon's mind, and it's this. China kills its own people. The Soviets kill not only their own people, but other people as well. In other words, people in other countries. And if you're Nixon, who and, and this is why I think Nixon is one of the worst presidents of the 20th century, is because he is so cynical that he completely erases the ideological component away from anything communist. And he says, listen, Mao... Fine. World's greatest mass murderer? Big deal. He only kills his own people. He's not a threat to the international order. Whereas yeah. the Soviets, yeah. they are. Not just in Europe, but also in Africa. And the thing that makes Nixon so repugnant to me is that he is so amoral in terms of how he looks at the international order that he's willing to deal with someone who is so one, ideological, and two, murderous, i.e. Mao. It, it, to me, it's outrageous from a moral standpoint. And it, this is why Ashbrook, and not only Ashbrook, but Democrats, like, uh, I forget his first name, but Vanek of Ohio, and uh, Scoop Jackson of Washington State, were so repulsed by Nixon's foreign policy. And it wasn't just Democrats. It was also Republicans like Ashbrook. And then, and of course, who's the most famous opponent of Nixon? Ronald Reagan. Hmm, I mean, that's fascinating. Yeah. So does, does, that become a part, does that become the cornerstone of his realism, Eric? I mean, you mentioned the fact that Nixon is, in many ways is the father of realism. Not, I wouldn't say simply the father, but the, per, the first president to really... I'd say practitioner, yeah. Practitioner, so that 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 the way you were just describing his attitude toward China becomes bedrock realist, realist principle in a way, and that's not the right word. But. One of my one of my areas of research is U.S. India foreign policy, and Nixon. I won't go into it now because it, I mean it's really like talking about inside baseball. But but Nixon's attitude about India was so cynical. Uh, Nixon's attitude about the Indians and the Pakistanis was so cynical that he basically, he didn't care about the human cost of what was occurring in India or Pakistan so long as it communicated to the Chinese that we were serious about being friends with them. And I know I'm leaving out a lot of details, but people, literally people died uh, because of Nixon's foreign policy, because of his moral cynicism, because of his conservative approach to um, to international relations, and right. But uh, if we have I, to choose, I, don't think, I was just going to say, playing devil's advocate here, if you have to, as you were saying earlier, if you have to choose uh, between the, the sort of the lesser of two evils, I know that's not a <laughs> desirable uh, situation or scenario. But if you've got to choose between the Soviet Union and and, and China on these things, isn't there something? Justifiable? Isn't there something almost Franklin Roosevelt-like in, in, you know, in the sense that Roosevelt was willing to make a deal with Stalin for the sake of defeating uh, Nazi Germany, or no? Uh, well, I'll say this for FDR: there was a greater evil out there. It's like, if, 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 if the real analogy would be if FDR had gone to Nick, had gone to Hitler in an effort to improve relations with Stalin, or vice versa. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Um, there was no, there was no greater evil that Nixon was trying to uh, was trying to defeat. All he, uh, the, the, um, all he really wanted was order. Now, in in Nixon's partial defense, Nixon had an understanding of the place of America in the world that was in fact mistaken. 
He thought that the United States was falling behind relative to the Soviet Union. He believed a lot of, of information was being fed to him by the CIA that turned out to be completely fallacious. Uh, we, don't, we didn't really learn until the 1980s what a basket case the Soviet Union was at this time. Um, had I like to think that had Nixon known the truth about what was really going on, he would have had a different approach. But of course, we can't answer. That's fascinating. Yeah, there's actually a little, there, there's a discussion in some of the scholarly journals right now about what Nixon knew versus what he didn't know. But John's absolutely right that he was being fed very erroneous information by the CIA. The CIA hmm. from probably the late 1950s, even going back into the Eisenhower administration, up into the 1980s, I, I might even extend it into the 90s, uh, exaggerated the uh, ability of the Soviet Union to pr project its, uh, its, its military power, uh, its economic power, as well as its cultural influence. And people like Nixon, Ford, Carter, and certainly Reagan in his first administration, were dead terrified of, of the, uh, the growing might of the, uh, of the Soviet menace. And it wasn't until Reagan's, the end of Reagan's first administration and, and beginning of his second administration that he actually began to think, oh my God, these, these people, the Soviets, are really weak. And to use a, a metaphor from John Le Carre, or is it John Le Carre, I forget how you pronounce it, uh, the, the knight is rotting inside his armor. Hmm. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's fascinating. But if, but if, you, under, but if you understand that this was the, these were the assumptions that the administration was operating under, it becomes more understandable but why he was willing to pursue this kind of, uh, this kind of policy. Better, I mean, if, 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 we're, if we're losing out in this race, it, it's it's understandable that you would want to try to make the best best kind of deal that you can. Actually, Chris, let me take it even further. It's not just that that, that Nixon and others thought that the Soviet Union was uh, was was rising. It's that they thought the United States was a power in decline. And so it's not just that the Soviet Union is going up. It's that they thought the United States is going down. For instance, at you know the Tet Offensive, which occurred in 1968 showed many Americans that the United States was not winning the war, at least to the extent, the Vietnam War, to the extent that the, uh, that the generals were telling the American public. Yeah. Nixon really bought into the idea that we are losing the Vietnam War. Hmm. Now, the economy, the economy, go ahead. The, the economy was headed south at the same time. Uh, the unprecedented turmoil domestically at home. Uh, Nixon was, and part of this was Nixon's own paranoia, but he was convinced that the, the government was in danger of being overthrown. That was his defense for, for all the dirty tricks he pulled, uh, up, you know, up, including the Watergate break-ins, was that this is, an, this is a time of crisis unlike any that's been seen since Nixon. So he always he always liked to cite Nixon I mean, to a certain extent FDR. This is a time of such grave national crisis that he's justified in doing things that ordinarily would be regarded as as, as unconstitutional. That's fantastic. Yeah. We go ahead, Eric. Sorry. 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 No, no. Go even further. And uh, what I would say about about Nixon is that the uh, the Vietnam War. Nixon seemed to forget. We need to take a step back and look at why the United States could not wage total war in Korea or Vietnam the way it could, say, in World War II or World War I. And the reason is nuclear weapons. Remember, one of the cornerstones of detente is arms control. In Vietnam, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the United States possessed the military capability of wiping out Ho Chi Minh, Jap, and the uh, and, and the, the the North Vietnamese Army, the NVA, we had that ability. But what would have happened had we done so? Had we done so, had we had the United States in the 1960s and 1970s done so, it would have drawn either the Soviet Union 
the Chinese or both into uh, a larger conflict. And that, and that conventional conflict almost certainly would have escalated into a nuclear conflict. And Nixon, he recognized that there is a nuclear danger, but he didn't seem to recognize that the reason why the United States could not win in Vietnam is because it was risking nuclear war. So on the one hand, uh, Nixon realized we're risking nuclear war. On the other hand, he, he seemed to think that we can't win this damn war and our hands are tied, tied behind our backs because of domestic protests or, uh, or journalists or, uh, or, or, or because the liberal establishment is, is, is conspiring against us. Johnson thought much of the same thing when he was president. But the basic reason why the United States didn't win the Vietnam War is because it was risking nuclear annihilation. I think that Nixon seemed to recognize half the lesson and not the other half. And, and that is in large part what motivates not only detente, but what I think is the failure of detente. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. This, is, this is really, this is really fascinating, the way you're describing this. I, I, um, I, I hesitate to do this. This is going back a little bit to a conversation we were having earlier, but there's a question that's been posed from uh, one of our, our teachers. Uh, I'll just read it. When, this was back when you were framing Nixon's uh, foreign policy in the conservative context as opposed to liberal. And um, the question is liberal change. If liberal change is, is uh, if liberal has changed the regime, that seems somehow defiant of the Bush administration to implant uh, democracy in Iraq. So I think the, the point of the question is where, where does Bush fit into that, <laughs> that conservative liberal approach to things? Anybody want to take a shot at this? Bush Jr. was one of the least conservative presidents we've had in terms of foreign policy. You want to know one of the most conservative we've had in terms of foreign policy? His dad, George Herbert Walker Bush, um, he said, look, the, the United States is going to form a coalition to prevent, to, 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 to re check and reverse um, uh, Iraqi aggression in Kuwait. And so we had the first Gulf War. But Bush didn't feel the need to, over, to, to, to topple Saddam Hussein's regime. His argument was, in, in, in fact, if you look and uh, you look at some of the higher ups in, in the Bush administration, there were some old retreads from the Nixon and Ford administrations there, mm -hmm. um, who said that we don't have to get rid of Saddam Hussein as long as he's contained, as long as he's forced out of Kuwait. Um, no, it's fine. Cheney and Rumsfeld are Nixon retreads. Yep. <laughs> That's fascinating. Okay. Oh, thanks very much for that, uh, that, 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 that clarification. Uh, Chris, and tell you that I would, yeah. I would argue that yeah. it's fair to say, this is, this is just my opinion, but I would say that Bush the Younger had a liberal foreign policy, and President Barack Obama has in many ways a conservative policy. That's mind-blowing. That's mind-blowing. <laughs> I, I, I think so, but I, I think... That, in, in, but not in uh, not in Libya. And had he had his way, he would have been far. He would have had us far more involved in Syria. Well, I'm not sure. I could, oh, there's your daughter. Uh, this is maybe an area where we might disagree again, John. But uh, I, I wonder frequently why uh, Rand Paul and the. Uh, uh, the libertarian right aren't more supportive of President Obama's retraction and uh, arguable isolationism. No, it, look, in many ways, in many ways, the libertarian right should see him as an improvement over over Bush Jr. Over Bush, but, but yeah, I, I, absolutely. But if you look at the intervention in Libya. The intervention that he wanted, what was prevented from having in Syria, um, I, I think he, I think Obama wanted to be, and certainly under the influence of Hillary Clinton, he wanted to be a more interventionist president than he was. Uh, Hillary Clinton is a different issue, and I'm, I don't want to uh, again, I don't want to, I don't want to turn this into a uh, an evening of Fox News or MSNBC, but uh, you're wrong, man. You're dead wrong. <laughs> well, this is why I asked the question. I, I, I knew they would get a reaction from both of you on this, that, that I 
I've seen you guys together so many times. I I, I just love that. That was great. Uh, we have about. We only have about. These people should know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, I know you guys are old friends. So, um, the uh, we have about ten minutes left, and I I, I want to shift gears a little bit. Maybe I'm, I'm on the fence about what to raise here because one of these could be a, a very time-consuming question. Um, I was thinking about raising the sort of specter. Of, I was thinking of raising the specter of uh, of George Hennen because when I think about Cold War strategy, here shaking his head no already. Uh, it's it's hard hard for me not to to uh, to think about how Kennan, especially in, in 46 with the long telegram, uh, uh, sort of shaped, well, I don't want to say shaped, but, but laid some sort of foundations for how we think about Cold War strategy. And, we, and Kennan, of course, was around during Nixon's um, administration. I, I wonder if either of you know what Kennan thought about uh, Nixon's detente and whether or not he thought this was a good strategy. Is there any, any evidence on that? Or maybe you just, maybe if you don't know anything, you can assess Nixon's performance in foreign policy in light of Kennan's. Uh, you know, I don't know what Kennan said about Nixon. I, I my suspicion is he didn't think much of him. However, if you look at the Kennan of uh, the 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 Kennan who, who if you look at Kennan's memoirs, for instance, the complaints that he had about the way American foreign policy was being handled. Uh, it, would, it would seem to me that he should have been quite supportive of what Nixon was doing. Um, he had, uh, Kennan would claim for almost all of his life that he had been misunderstood in the uh, in the long telegram and the X article of night, uh, in Foreign Affairs in 1947. That in fact he had never meant containment to to, to outlast Stalin. He thought it was an appropriate response to Stalin's very aggressive policy, but with the death of Stalin, that the, the, the time it had come to to abandon the policy. Um, that, 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 and and one of the things that Kennan really would have ought to have appreciated, I don't know if he did, but he ought to have appreciated the the lack of emphasis on ideology. Um, Kennan always said that, that communism was not particularly important except as a fig leaf for what the Russians were trying to do. And what were the Russians trying to do? It was just traditional Russian nationalism. There was nothing that Stalin had been up to that would not have been understandable to Nicholas II or indeed of Catherine the Great in the 18th century. Interesting. That's fascinating. Uh, Chris, what I would say about that is uh, Kennan... Uh, after after you read uh, the biography, there there are two really good, and I, and I have problems with both of them, but they're both examples of, of, of really good scholarship. There's Frank Castigliola's uh, editing of of uh, uh, Kennan's uh, diaries, and then there's the John Lewis Gaddis, who by the way was John Moser's teacher. Uh, John Lewis Gaddis wrote a, a, what I think is a really solid biography of, of, of Kennan. And I think what you'll find in both works is that, uh, I, would, I would agree exactly with what John said, but I'd go a little further. And what I'd say is, is that during the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s, Kennan was actually very pleased with the lack of confrontation. He didn't, Kennan didn't. Nixon didn't feel he had to make communism or anti-Soviet behavior a global phenomenon. What he had to do was contain the Soviet ideological threat. The problem, Kennan found, is that uh, Nixon, Nixon didn't really seem to get the fact that even as conservative as the Soviets were, they still posed an ideological threat to the West, particularly in the developing world. And the guy that who the guy that understood that wasn't Kennan, who by by the way was irrelevant by the year 1950. Right. Kennan doesn't matter at all by 1950. The guy who understood it more than anyone wasn't Ashbrook. It wasn't Vanek. It wasn't it wasn't Scoop Jackson. It was actually, in my opinion, it was Ronald Reagan. And the thing the thing that I really like about Ronald Reagan is that when he ran for president in 1980. He was running as much against Nixon and Ford and their policy of detente as he was against Jimmy Carter. Mm 
And the reason why is because he couldn't believe it. I mean, he was slapping his forehead. It's like, what is it with this guy, Nixon? He doesn't understand that the Soviets are an ideological threat? What's wrong with you, man? And detente was as offensive to Ronald Reagan as I think, I think racism is to President Obama. And I don't think I'm out of school in saying such a thing. Hmm. Oh, that's, 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 that's amazing. Yeah. Well, well, I guess John agrees with you. He's not, he's not responding. So. No, that's no, no, right. Uh, can I, can I take just a few, this is, this has been great so far. We just have a few minutes left. Can I just take a few minutes uh, to ask about the influence of Kissinger? His name came up earlier. Uh, you know, we all we've all read and heard things that and so, one of the myths, I think, maybe it isn't a myth. You tell me that, that Nixon was was really um, uh, well, it was really Kissinger that was kind of running the show, the foreign policy show for Nixon. True or false? True or false? False. What do you think, John? Okay. Okay. Yeah. False. Very false. interesting. Really, really important. <laughs> He's really right. important. But right. Nixon calls the shots. Yeah. And yeah. Henry, yeah. John, John said something to me a few years ago that I think was really apt, but it's even more apt in his, Kissinger's case. He told me no one was a better promoter of the Churchill image and mystique than Churchill. But no one is a better promoter of the Kissinger mystique than Kissinger. I mean, for God's sakes, the man is still alive. What is he, 150? My God! <laughs> they just published a new. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, it's it's incredible. I I, will, I hope God willing I should have such a such a reputation at his age. I'm jealous as hell. But to, to tell you the truth, the guy is a relentless self promoter, and he does. Even though I think Nixon was a horrible president, he does a disservice to Nixon. Nixon was his own man. To suggest that Nixon is cowed by Kissinger's intellect by his persuasive power is to distort history. Nixon was not that kind of guy. Yeah. It's just, yeah. it goes against the historical record. And, mm -hmm. and, well, the way that Nixon talked about Kissinger when Kissinger wasn't in the room was downright shocking. Uh, shocking. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Really? Oh, I don't know. Bring me the well, he, he said, yeah, you're not true boy, that true boy, Kissinger. Yeah, well, I, I mean, Nixon was one of the biggest potty mouths who've ever, who've ever occupied the Oval Office. Um, yeah. Okay. You, yeah. You look at, you look at the, 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 you listen to the Nixon tapes and look at the transcripts of them. I mean. A man makes Moser look like a prude. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, we've, we've, we've come to the end of our time here almost, and I, I have to ask, Eric, earlier you said that uh, you rank Nixon among the three worst presidents of all time, along with Carter and Woodrow Wilson. John, do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I, I can't really think of any, uh, of any that I would add or subtract from that, from that list. Um, I, I think, in fact, Carter wasn't quite as bad as the other two, but, but he belongs in the... He belongs as the uh, as the third in the top in, in the top three, or the, wow. the bottom three, I should say. Okay. If we, if we all say top three. Top three. I put Eisenhower in there. I put Eisenhower in there. What? Uh, I put Reagan. Reagan. Top three. I would say. I would say. Coolidge, Eisenhower, Reagan. Reagan. Coolidge. Say that again, John. Who? Reagan, Eisenhower, and Coolidge. But, but Coolidge, Coolidge. Coolidge, I don't say because of foreign policy. Because what was the, I mean, what was the Coolidge foreign policy? Actually, I think it was a quite lovable foreign policy. It's you know, stay the hell out of foreign affairs. <laughs> John, you're gonna get real mad at me, but my attitude is Roosevelt, Reagan, Eisenhower, and uh, I, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't hate Roosevelt, reason, but I would put him in the top three. I'll tell you why. I think during the 30s, the man was a whore and an appeas uh, an appeaser. But during the Second World War, his World War II leadership is absolute, not absolutely, it's mostly unassailable. I, I think he's a magnificent wartime president. I think he's 
horrible on the New Deal, and I think he's horrible as a domestic president. There are all sorts of areas we can criticism criticize him, but my God, his his coalition management was magnificent. Okay. Yeah, he had a good sense. Of who should be at the top? This thing is recorded. You know, I'm. I, I wouldn't say that lightly. <laughs> uh, well, I guess. Uh, well, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this is what you. This is what I expect when these two get together, whether it's uh, over beers or in the classroom. Um, so we're going to have to end it with that. But I, I thank you both very much. I have to say, I'm a little disappointed because I thought maybe I'd come away from this uh, having learned some positive things about uh, Nixon's presidency. Not that I didn't learn anything. I learned a lot. I'm not disappointed in how much I learned, but. Uh, I thank you both very much for your time and your insights. This has been very, very, uh, very enlightening and, and useful. And, and let me just thank mention, if, uh, if uh, yeah, thanks again uh, to both of you. If, any, if anyone's interested in seeing these two in action in person, uh, maybe you'd be interested in looking into a, either an online or on-campus course uh, as part of our Master of American uh, Master of Arts in American History and Government program at Ashland University. Again. You can find out more about that by looking at teachingamericanhistory.org online. Um, um, and if you enjoyed these kinds of conversations in, in the webinar format, uh, please feel free to join us for our uh, next Saturday webinar, which is on Abraham Lincoln, the Great Emancipator. That's on December 12th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And we'll be joined then with uh, by Lucas Morrell of Washington and Lee University and Jonathan White. Of Christopher Newport University. So, if you're if you're so inclined, please feel free to join us. Again, you can find out more information on tah.org or teachingamericanhistory.org. Gentlemen, again, thank you very much. I've I've learned a great deal. Enjoyed it very much. Very much. Thanks, all of you. Yes, and thanks for the participants who joined us.